Good evening, everyone. Our speaker tonight is James McGrath Morris, and he's going to be speaking about researching your book. James McGrath Morris is an award-winning and New York Times best-selling author. His books include The Ambulance Drivers, Hemingway, Dos Passos, and A Friendship Made and Lost in War, as well as Eye on the Struggle, Ethel Payne, The First Lady of the Black Press. His newest book, Tony Hillerman, A Life, will be published in October. He lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico. You may visit his website at jamesmcgrathmorris.com. And with that, James, I will turn it over to you. It's really, um, every, I want a thumbs up if you can hear me. You're, am I loud and clear? Okay, good. Um, it's really great to be back with you. I was talking with my, my wife today, and I believe the first time I gave a talk with Southwest Writers was 17 years ago in 2004. Uh, and I was talking about uh, narrative nonfiction and more general talk. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the reason I really love sharing ideas about research is that it's the key in giving fiction verisimilitude and it's the key in making non bring nonfiction alive. And by that, um, I go back to a, a years when I was a reporter and we used to describe things as way cool facts, uh, meaning facts that made you want to share them with somebody else. And years ago when my second book came out, I was in the office of a rather well-known fellow and he was very gruff. And he said, well, I'm not gonna read your book. I thought, why was he saying that? It seemed rather harsh. And he said, your publisher sent a copy to my wife. You know how publishers send out advance review copies to stimulate interest. And every night when we were lying in bed and she was reading your book, she would elbow me and say, did you know this? Did you know that? And I realized that's the payoff you want. So um, research can provide you with those golden moments. Uh, another example I could give you is when I did a book on Joseph Pulitzer. I found out they gave him uh, a big meal in St. Louis celebrating his achievements. And it could have been easily written that he, they served an eight course meal. But what I discovered is I was able to find the menu for the meal. And it's not because I'm a vegan and I'm meat sensitive. It's there's been a change in a century since then. In the 1890s, it was not uncommon to have eight courses of different meats. So you might start off with rabbit and move into pheasant and all kinds of things. And I, this book was 600 pages, a doorstopper. And more people have said to me, I couldn't believe what they ate. So research can dig up these things for you. Um, during my talk, um, please feel free to put questions in um, the chat room. I'll look at them while I'm talking. Sometimes I can work my answers into my talk and sometimes I'll answer them separately. Most important, I will put up my email address in the chat room. My email address is really easy. It's mail, M-A-I-L, at jamesmcgrathmorris.com. And the reason is I'm holding up a little artifact here. A lot of the websites and things I refer to, you would be spending all your time trying to write them down uh, if you want to use them. And instead, I've developed this PDF that I'm glad to send to you if you send me a note saying, send me your research links. In return, of course, I now get your email, so someday you might get an announcement about my speaking in Albuquerque or publishing a new book. But it's much easier to do this than for me to have a slide in which you're trying to write down ProQuest and Heithy Trust and Project Gutenberg and all of those things. So I start with the, perhaps the largest source of research material you can find today didn't exist when I wrote my first book. And it's not just the internet. It's the digitization of publications. Newspapers have been digitized at such a phenomenal rate that one of the points I make in these workshops, if it takes you two to three years to do a book, like it takes me two to three years to do a book, you cannot check off your list. I checked all of these newspapers because a month after you've done some of this database work, another half million pages have been loaded up on some of these sites. So you put the same key search in and suddenly you discover all these new things. So one of the problems you wanna face is if you use digital records, keep in mind that they're constantly dumping more material on them. So you have to go back to them quite regularly, which leads me to a, a useful uh, tip that I give people. 
It's very important when you're doing research to keep track of what you've researched. So I keep a notebook, um, some people, and I keep a complicated set of tables in my, my computer. Because for instance, um, going through Hillerman's papers, which were 20 process boxes and about 20 unprocessed boxes, what typically happens is you're sitting there typing a great comment that he made to his wife in a letter. And it sounds somewhat familiar. You realize, yes, you looked through that file folder two years earlier. So I keep a chart that tells me which file folders I've been through and describes them. So tracking your own research is very important. So let's start in with newspapers. The most common and widely used database for newspapers is something called ProQuest, P-R-O-Q-U-E-S-T. Again, this is spelled out with links on the thing you're gonna get, so don't worry about writing it down. ProQuest is a very large company. It, it digitizes tons of stuff. What I'm speaking is about one of their products, which is historical newspapers. And this is where using somebody who has spent a lot of time doing research can save you a lot of heartache, is understanding the nature of these companies. So you go into the Albuquerque Public Library, you go to UNM, and you say to the reference librarian, I'd like to use ProQuest, and they set you up to use ProQuest, which by the way, if you physically go into UNM's library and bring in your own laptop, you have access to all these proprietary databases. Unless you have an e a UNM EDU address, you can't get into them from outside the university. And I won't bore you with the reasons why, but if you're physically within the uh, library system, you can use these databases. ProQuest has a number of products. So they have digitized the Hartford Current, the New York Times back to 1851, the Washington Post, black newspapers like the Chicago Defender, the Los Angeles Times, uh, the Boston Globe, I mean, you can go on. But that does not mean you have access to all of them at UNM or at the Albuquerque Public Library. Those libraries have made a decision about what parts of ProQuest to get. So if you're looking for uh, information on train travel in the 19th century and you wanted to know about a particular train and you think I've done my search, you may not have done your search because it may not include all the papers. So the best way to go about this is to go to ProQuest's own site and I give you the link to it. And it, what it does is it tells you all of the papers they have digitized that way when you are, and you print it out, that way when you go to a major library, you can find out if you're actually searching those papers or not. What they're wonderful is that if you're as old as I am, we used to have indexes, like the New York Times proudly published a monthly index to all its pages. Unfortunately, it was kind of a lie. They only indexed those things they thought were worth indexing. They did not index advertisement and they did not index gossip and little things. By being able to search something like the New York Times by keyword, when I was do doing my book on Charles Chapin, I was able to find when he was staying in New York hotels because the habit of a 19th century newspaper was to publish so-and-so is staying at the Madison Hotel for two days, so-and-so is staying at the Fifth Avenue Motel. Now, granted, these were primarily well-to-do people, but it could allow you to track their, their passage and know when they're in New York. That was not indexed. Legal ads, so-and-so suing another person, that was not indexed. So these digitization of newspapers have opened up a huge uh, possibility for us to do research and do it quickly. Um, somebody I noticed on the chat room asked about foreign papers. Yes, foreign papers are being digitized at the same prodigious rate. And there are varieties of ways you can tap into them. Um, some through overseas libraries like the British Museum, some may not let you get in, but you, there, are, there are ways to get about it. Um, and, they, and if you have a specific country in mind, I might be able to give you some of the answers by emailing me. I won't bore you with all of the details, but there are, there are ways to get some of them. It depends on who supports it. The project Chronicling America, which is done by the Library of Congress, is free and open to the public on the internet. So if you were in France or in Moscow, you could have access to it. That same kind of rule, uh, uh, works overseas. So if the French government is supporting a digitization process, it's likely to be up, open on the internet. If it is a private company like ProQuest or Redex or newspaper.com, it is not going to be open to you. 
Um, so a couple more companies to keep in mind. Redex is a rival to ProQuest. It tends to have access to older papers. So if you're doing a novel about set in colonial America, and you wanted to know how many days ride it was by horse from Boston to Hartford, or what, what or you wanted a description of a flood that closed the road, or you wanted um, to know how much gingham cost back then, or when the ships came and arrived so your protagonist can get off in the Boston Harbor at the right time. Uh, Redex is a really good source for that. Again, you'd have to go into a library uh, to have access to that. Newspapers.com is the small D version of all of these websites. You can get on it online, it's, but you do have to pay. It's a very affordable amount. I believe it's somewhere in the $20 a month. So you could subscribe for a month and then cancel your subscription and do all your research. The difference between newspaper.com and ProQuest and others is they have not been as intentional in doing their scanning. Basically, what they have done is bought runs of paper, paper, paper papers, if I can call them that, printed on paper. So let's say they, they were in Sedalia and somebody sold the whole set of Sedalia Democrats. They have digitized that, but they haven't digitized the St. Louis uh, Globe. I mean, it just depends. So you, you, it's a hit or miss. But again, think outside the box. What's quite remarkable is that the Associated Press, which was created after the Civil War, during the Civil War, and UP, which came into existence in the 20th century, which we now know as UPI, covered extensively amount, extensive amount of stuff and sent out what we call wire copy to newspapers around the country. Very often, a small paper like the Galveston paper would have a long article about some ball in New York or some social event in Chicago or something like that because they had to fill a news hole. They're selling the paper full of advertisement. They gotta have stuff around the advertisement to track their readers. So they might run a really long article, whereas the major papers like the Boston Globe might have only run the shortened version of the Associated Press piece. So sometimes it's kind of funny, you look at my end notes and you see all these references to things like the Galveston newspaper. And my subject never went to Galveston, but that's because they were printing the entire dispatch that I wanted. So the four that you'll find on the sheet that I mentioned are ProQuest, Redex, Newspaper.com, and Chronicling America. And that would be a great starting place, but it's only a starting place. And this is where befriending a reference librarian is the best investment you can do if you're a fiction writer or a nonfiction writer, because a lot of states have gotten NEH grants to digitize their own newspapers like New Mexico has a site where you can search New Mexico newspapers. That's not part of these larger companies. And many of these are free and open to the public. So Minnesota, I've used their papers, Illinois, and they're, they're valuable troves. They're often run through the State Historical Society or the State Library. Um, it's a really fragmented system. It is, um, it's chaotic. Um, and the best way you get to stuff is to interact with other writers. If you're part of a group that writes historical fiction set in the Depression, meet other writers who are doing that same thing because they'll have some sources from newspapers that you won't necessarily run across. So the first starting point in doing research work like this is historical newspapers, and those are the four starting points I'd suggest. The other thing that's revolutionary since I started in this business is the digitization of books. Google Books, which has been very controversial because they went into some libraries and scanned books that were under, still under copyright and got into real fights with the Authors Guild. And that included some books that I'd written that were still for sale in bookstores. That's calmed down because they seem to do this less, but it's the simplest and most treasured trove of stuff. And you, if you're used to using Google, you know one of the features is a pull down that says books. Well, what's remarkable about it, if you're really good at Google searching skills, you can use the same one for books. So you can use quote marks, associated terms. You know, um, if, you're, if your character trying to research is John Smith, you're really in trouble. But in my case, my first big book was uh, Joseph Pulitzer, which is a name that's unusual. 
Um, but you'll get all kinds of things that are that are quite remarkable. When I was doing Tony Hillerman, the book that is coming out this October, I found a lot of war memoirs that have been privately published, and they were on Google Books, not in anywhere else, and they were terribly valuable. So Hillerman was very helpful because it's an unusual name, and so I could put Tony Hillerman in quote marks along with war as a separate term or something like that. So I found little... My, the likelihood with my years of doing research, I'm going to find the big books easily, but stumbling across these little personal memoirs often is a case of using Google Books. A very unusual group, and I've never looked up the origin or the name, is the Hathi, and again, this is spelled out on the handout, H-A-T-H-I Trust. It's a not-for-profit company, and it offers digital access to, I think at this point, millions of books. And they also are working with other groups that have digitized magazines. So some of this stuff is migrating. So again, this is this business of don't think you're done when you think you're done, because when you go back, you may find that the um, making of modern, uh, making of America digitization of magazines is suddenly now part over here. Um, consulting with the librarian will, who, who keeps up with this a lot will help you. But Haiti Trust is a really valuable site, as well as something called Project Gutenberg. It's Guten, Project Gutenberg is very similar to Google Books, but it's been much more careful to observe copyright than Google Books ever were. So we've done books, and I'll give you an overview of books and historical newspapers. Magazines are um, a treasure trove. Uh, and one of the best start, sites to start with is something called Making of America. You may get confused if you look for it because there's several of them. That's because it's a project that several universities did to digitize their own collection of magazines. And some of these magazines are rivetingly fascinating. Um, for instance, in the, uh, let's see, would have been, I guess, early 19th century, early 20th century, maybe late 19th century, uh, we, mill in the Northeast published a magazine as a means of publicizing their wheat. And they filled it with interesting stuff, including Zuni uh, uh, stories from the Zuni Pueblo that connected to Hillerman. And that's how I found these stories. So don't just think about life and Harper, Harper Magazine or Nation Magazine, which a magazine is going back 100 years. You may find right, magazines that you've never thought of before. Um, so those are the three main print areas, and then I'm going to get to archives, music, and some other things. My approach to research is I do, I go to a lot of writers' conferences, and I say to somebody, you know, to make conversation, how's your book coming? And they say, I'm almost done with the research, I'm going to start the writing first. To me, that's really the wrong approach. Um, you need to start the writing from the first day of doing your book and do research 99% of the time. The next day you're doing writing 2% of the time and researching 98% of the time. 3% writing, 97% research. I'm sure you see where this is going without my counting down to 100. Because one of the aspects about research is just like a detective, you don't know what it is you need to research until you begin to tell your story. And this is true whether it's fiction or nonfiction. In that, Let's say you want to have, um, you know, when you're writing fiction, your characters do all kinds of things on their own. I mean, you don't know why, but suddenly you're back at your book and your characters decided to take a train ride somewhere or decide to have lunch with somebody or decide to stay in a hotel. You don't know that you need material to describe that scene until you know your character's going there. So you couldn't have researched all of that or else you'd have a library of research. So now you have a scene in which... Um, He's in a hotel room and he's going to, and you have the letter that says, I'm writing you from the Fifth Avenue Hotel in New York. And the letter is a particularly important letter and he's angry. This is for nonfiction. Um, so it's a true letter. You have the letter and you know he's in the hotel and you know the date. One of the great ways to bring activity to that letter, as opposed to simply reporting its contents, is to have your character write the letter. So you go online and you discover what the hotel looked like back then. You can even get photos about it. I'll find that later. You can find diaries of people describing the decor in the room. 
And that way you can animate your scene. You can have your character, in this case, mine was Joseph Pulitzer, go to the desk, take a piece of linen stationery. You know it's linen because you've seen the piece of stationery. Take a pencil and he angrily writes. Why do we know it's angrily? Because the pencil goes through the paper at certain moments. Um, all of those kinds of things, um, letter boxes. Um, my, one of my characters killed his wife and then went and sent a note to the police. Um, and he deposited them in a letter box in New York. They didn't have blue letter blocks, boxes like we did today. So I was able to find out what the letter box looked like. In fact, I found out something really cool. New, New York in the, in, 19, in the 20th century had pneumatic tubes. So you could send a letter from uptown to downtown inviting somebody for dinner and they reply before the end of the dinner. Um, that's a way cool fact that people liked. So in animating your fiction or your nonfiction, these magazines, these books and historical newspapers can give you the fodder to, um, uh, I see a question about where to find diaries. I'll get to that, I promise. Um, we'll give you fodder to give the book texture and, real, and reality. Um, there have been more novels that I've read where there's an inaccuracy about something I know. And it, it takes you away from the story in the sense that instead of surrendering to this author, you go, oh, I don't think the trains did that or you know, the sun didn't do that or that kind of thing. So obedience to the real world when you place your character in your fictional world is very important. Secondly, and um, Tony Hillerman talked about this when he taught writing at UNM, why make up things when you don't necessarily need to make up things in the sense that if you're having, um, your character have breakfast with their lover at the frontier after a passionate night, just go to the frontier and take notes about the vinyl, the cracked vinyl, the numbering system. I mean, you don't need to take notes because you've all been there. Well, you can do the same thing historically. You can go and find that restaurant, uh, find out, um, you know, for instance, um, I wrote a book about an African-American reporter and um, I could find tons of stuff about which restaurants would not let her in, and then descriptions of the integrated restaurants in New York, and that animates the story. So those sources can do that. Now, somebody asked about where you can find diaries, and I'm on to that. Your second best friend after making friends with a re reference librarian is an archivist, and it doesn't have to be an archivist of of the, uh, and just start with your archivists, for instance, an archivist at the Center for Southwest Research, even though they know their own material best, they may be able to suggest ways to find things. Archivists welcome your inquiries. It doesn't matter if you're a published or unpublished or widely published author, because an archivist's mission is to have their material used. Um, frequently, when I publish a book, I will suddenly see a, um, uh, a fundraising appeal from the Columbia University Library, and they'll send out, you know, 10,000 letters to people saying donate to the library. And one of the things they'll say is, so-and-so's book was researched in our library. It gives them validity for their work, helps them raise money, and it helps demonstrate to the foundations they support that their material is being used. So calling up an archivist in Minnesota or in Illinois or in Washington State is not an imposition on them. I mean, no, they work hard, so they're not gonna answer you maybe in five minutes, but they really, it's a culture of welcome on their part. So for instance, there are two major card catalogs, if you wish, of stuff that's contained in archives. So for instance, if you're looking for a diary, and there are two uses of diaries I'll get to in a second. The first is something called World Cat, Unfortunately, it's also known to people older as OCLC or First Search. And on this sheet, I give you a link to it. You can access that on the internet without going into a library. And if you get used to searching it for it and you have selections on the side where it says search only printed books, search only archives, search only video, et cetera, you can find uh, a diary that was written by somebody left behind and it might have been left behind to the Lake County Historical Society. One of the things I uncovered when I wrote a book about Joseph Pulitzer was that his last son was not his son biologically. It 
turns out his wife had had an affair. And if you were to read my book and you get to that point, you'd probably go, go Kate, because he was such an awful man and so unlovable that I could understand why anyone would go out and have an affair if you were married to him. How did I find this out? I found the love letters in, the, in a tiny historical society in Ohio. And it wasn't because I had any major skills, but I had done a search through Archives Grid, which is like OCLC. Again, it's on the sheet. And Archives Grid had letters, a folder of unidentified letters, I mean, identified by the author, but unidentified, no more than just saying, and I found them. A little aside here, some of you are thinking, well, this is fine, Jamie. You're, you're writing full time, you probably have funds to be able to fly off to Detroit to look at some papers. There is an alternative today, and it's grand, gladly granted to you by something called the iPhone. Every one of these archives around the country maintains a list of researchers, generally desperate graduate students, who are willing to come in and do some work for you. I pay them $25 an hour. And you don't have to worry about them doing interpretive work. What you do is you say to them, the archivist says, yes, we have a file folder with 20 letters, or we have a, a diary by your person sitting here. They will come in with their iPhone, take a photograph of each page and email it to you. You don't have to stay in Motel 6. You don't have to fly Southwest. You don't have to go through any of those things. And the archivist, again, who I told you are your best friend, will supply that with you. Um, so we've got magazines, books, historical newspapers. I'm moving quickly so we can do some discussion in archives. Um, one of the great things that, that I'm always reminded, whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction, is to activate the senses of your reader. Smells sounds, sights, taste, all of those kinds of things bring, bring things alive. And music is really powerful in that respect. Um, during World War II, the Germans often unnerved the Americans by singing hit songs that had just become a hit back in the United States when they were in trenches 500 yards away. Hillerman describes hearing a song he'd only heard once before he shipped out from the US. So finding those songs can be really valuable. You can quote from them. Of course, please be careful co about copyright. Songs or lyrics are protected like poems. So using more than two lines or so can get you in trouble without seeking clearance. But nonetheless, it can bring an illusion to somebody. Um, you're gonna think this is funny, but my wife said something about physical. And I said, you mean like, let's get physical. And we couldn't remember the song. So I went to Google and it was Olivia Newton-John singing it. The video is a flashback to, you know, what people wore to those, those exercise classes. The, that brought back memories and stimulated memories to me. And I thought if I was a novelist, that kind of little tidbit, you've got your protagonist is in a car and she turns on the radio. You want a song that was popular that year because if you make the mistake of saying, you know, like Olivia Luton John singing before the person had a chance to do it, that's an anachronistic reference and it will, it will screw things up. Hilleman made a lot of mistakes like many authors do in their books about having plants grow where they don't grow, uh, computers exist when they didn't, things like that. And you get letters from the readers, but more importantly, that lack of authenticity will undermine your work. So I list a couple of um, sites that have music collections. The most impressive is the Library of Congress and they have archivists. Uh, I know one woman who works there and every day all she does is help answer questions from, from readers who, or from writers who say, um, you know, I'd like to know what a, a black jazz song that was popular in New Orleans around 1912 or maybe in 1905. Here's an example. You know about the Great Migration, how African Americans left the South and drove starting in 1905 and populated cities like Detroit and Chicago. Well, they didn't just leave physically, they also brought music with them, they brought food with them, etc. Imagine if you're setting a novel in South Side Chicago, you can go to the Chicago Defender, a black run newspaper, and find out what kind of food was being served in the restaurants how much it cost to be buried. Why? Because Chicago is segregated. And so the South Side had its own black owned funeral homes, its own black owned 
cosmetic companies, et cetera. And all these tidbits are sitting in the Chicago Defender for you to use. Um, photos are a wonderful thing. Um, when I wrote a book and this guy got sent off to prison and lived in Sing Sing prison, I was able to print off dozens and dozens of photographs and I pasted my wall with them so that when he left his cell and went, he grew roses and walked across his rose gardens, I could actually describe how wide the rose garden beds were, how tall, you know, when Sir Thomas Lipton stood, I could say Sir Thomas Lipton stood next to the three feet tall rose bushes that were blooming at that month. All those kinds of details are available uh, easily to you from, um, uh, uh, from photographs. So for instance, the li back to Library of Congress, they have a remarkable collection, but so do historical societies around the country. The New York um, Municipal Archives has a remarkable collection of photographs because, and again, I, don't hold me to the years, but let's say it was the 30s or 40s, they were gonna do some major infrastructure work in New York. So they hired photographers to go and take photographs of virtually every street in New York. So if you were a novelist, you could put your character on a particular street and you could describe the texture of the street when they come out. Um, you know, whether there were horse and carriages still present, how much, I kid you not, uh, horses have a problem. They tend to go to the bathroom on the street. Um, you know, all these kinds of just great little tidbits all available now. Um, so let's see. Um, Oh, great. Somebody mentioned they spend time at the UNM Health Center's library and during the shutdown and sit outside on a bench. I did that as well. Um, I, not the UNM uh, Health, but I did go down once to UNM and, and use, um, use their internet. So briefly, the reason you have to be physically there is UNM libraries, like any major university library, signs a contract with ProQuest, and it's a big contract, We're talking about lots of money. JSTOR is another one, Muse is another one, all of these things. And the contract rules is that only members of the university community can, can have access to it. So if you're a, a professor, you can access to it at home because your email identifies you and you can log into the password. But the rest of us can't without physically going into the library. But once you're physically in the library or leaning up on the wall outside, you are at that point part of the community. Defend your right. At one point, UNM's computer gurus cut off access to people inside the library without a password, or without a UNM ID. And I, within an hour, I went up to see the dean of the library. He's since retired. And I said to him, you can't do this. And he said, well, you know, our computer people. I said, no, you don't understand. A, my tax dollars go to support this institution. And B, you're like cooperative extension. I make my living using the state-owned and state-funded facility. You can have restrictions on it, which are reasonable, like I shouldn't be able to research from my room, my bedroom in Santa Fe. But barring me admission is, is patently wrong. And within a day, they reopened it. So they're not against you. It's just that what happens is, as you know, the computer culture who runs these things and librarians aren't necessarily the same. Librarians want you to have this stuff. They may, the others may say, oh, it's too complicated. Um, so that's sort of my overview um, of, of research tools and research things. Um, usually at this point when I've done these, I get a thousand questions. If not, I have other things to, to address that may help you. So I'll pause for a second. Uh, everybody should be able to see your mis your um, messages. Um, so um, while I'm waiting for some of them to come up, um, I've done research workshops for quite a while, um, more specific ones sometimes about um, about you know a specific area of research, let's say um, black owned publications or something. But one of the common themes I've found, is depending on the trainer of your writer, and I'm not saying anything negative about, about any of you folks. One of the most common problems I find is somebody says, I found this, and I said, great, where did you find it? And they did not link the source with the item. So they went into an archive and they spent several days reading somebody's diary, reading somebody's letters and taking notes. Now it's time to write the book and they need to make some end notes that says this quotation was taken from um, uh, 
uh, from a letter from Tony Hillerman to Marie and the date, but you have no file folder or no, no source that you need. So one of the tips I make is that you take a little piece of paper and you write down file folder three box 18 and put it next to the item that you're photographing that you're gonna print out when you get home. Um, the other way to do it, of course, is if you type notes like I do, is I type index cards and at the bottom of each quotation, each thing I, I, uh, I take, I write the source in a shorthand that allows me to, to get back to it. Um, oh, somebody mentioned uh, microfiche. Carnegie Library in Pittsburgh has old newspapers on microfiche. Microfiche is, of course, one of the great horrors of when we thought it was a great thing and discovered it wasn't. Absolutely impossible to read. Um, the machine's all scratched. Uh, all kinds of things are a nightmare. I'm going to get to Jacqueline, your question. Um, it is only a good idea to hire a grad student to look at the microfiche <clears throat> if you have the specific page of a newspaper that you want them to find. You don't want them to use their research judgment going through a microfiche and say there's nothing in there for you. Secondly, if it is microfiche, it is very likely that that newspaper is now available digitally because the librarians who made the decision to microfiche it are the same librarians who encouraged it to be digitized. And the, the extent of digitization is, is mind boggling. I wrote one of my earliest books, I'm gonna slide back here and grab something. One of my first books, is this book called Jailhouse Journalism. It's a book about newspapers and magazines published in American prisons by inmates. Well, that book came out in 1980. This year, JSTOR, one of these big academic companies, has been digitizing um, all of these papers from prisons. So let's say you're writing a novel and you have a character who's locked up in Sing Sing or sent to Alcatraz. You've got a treasure trove of accessible stuff from these papers. So what I'm getting at is the likelihood is that if it, is, if it exists on a microfiche, it has been digitized. Um, yes, the Zimmerman has, uh, has material um, that is microfiched as well as, um, as, well as uh, uh, microfilm. The library right now is open uh, in limited basis as I'm going there on Friday, but that's of course gonna change again with the, sur the sudden surge, we'll see what happens. Um, uh, okay, let me get back to, uh, we're gonna get to the, the, your case of what you're looking for in news articles, Chris, Chris in a second. Um, why would a reader have to pay for a newspaper article and what is the normal price to pay? Newspapers published before about 1924, I think 24 is the cutoff now, are in the public domain. So the actual words they used can be quoted by anyone. So if you can find the article, they're yours to quote without any payment of fee. Um, and again, fair use permits you to quote from newspapers uh, in your account, as long as you don't exceed certain parameters and, and any quick research on fair use will allow you to do that. So the question is, um, I'm trying to make sure, Jacqueline, if you're asking if you have to pay for a newspaper article or if you have to pay to have access to get it. Um, and if you're paying to get access to get it, newspapers.com, to give you a sense, is about $20 to $25 a month. ProQuest and all those things are free of charge, again, if you go into a university library. Um, you paid, oh, paid $53. Okay, you, you included a full length article, I believe, from your description. Uh, and if you paid $53, you probably got a, a good price. I'll give you a horror story. Uh, my last book was about Hemingway and John Dos Passos. The Dos Passos estate granted me permission at no charge to use his letters and excerpts from the book. The Hemingway estate, was asking me to pay $10,000 for the first 10,000 books printed. That's a dollar a book, which meant I was gonna be giving up, you know, 30% of my royalties, starting royalties to them. Uh, so I, luckily I'm, I have a lot of connections from having worked in organizing writers for years. And I knew the former attorney for the Authors Guild 
when she and I reviewed it, we withdrew my request from the Hemingway estate and instead submitted a letter saying we've analyzed what I want to use and we believe it's covered by fair use and we're prepared to go to court to prove it. And they shut up and never bugged me. So what is the fair price is always hard to know. Um, I paid $200 for some photographs that I had waited a year for the, delayed the book by a year. I wouldn't have paid for them because they fell into public domain eventually. Um, usually paying anything for an article is rare unless you're reproducing the entire article as an artifact in your book. Paying for photographs is very different. Um, and I have run into cases where I've chosen not to use a photograph because the photographer was completely unrealistic and expecting to earn enough money to not work for several years. Because I know you know this, people out there think we earn a fortune from doing these books. I've called up people and said, you know, could I interview them and say, sure, what are you planning on paying me? I'm saying, paying you, I'm going to drive all the way to Oklahoma to visit you and I'll buy you lunch. But that's about all my budget has. So I don't think, Jacqueline, you overpaid if you used it as a full artifact in, the, um, in, your, um, in your book. Um, so I see somebody's worried about cracking the service and making mischief. That happens to all of us. Uh, other thoughts, questions, specific questions about any kind of research? And am I just going on too much? I mean, if there's stuff you want me to go back over, I'm glad to do. Um, And again, the links I'll send to you is, um, and I'll post my email mess my email address again. If you send it to me, I'll send you the PDF. Probably not tonight, because I want to. How do you locate a grad student? Oh, that's not hard. Um, uh, oh, and I'll get the genealogy, Brenda. Um, if you, if it's just a, a research around the library, I'd still start with the library's archivist because that's most likely where they'll know. And almost every archive that I have dealt with, they maintain a list of vetted graduate students and they'll email you a list. Sometimes it's just a list of 10 people. Sometimes it's a list of so-and-so that says, John Smith, uh, pursuing a PhD in colonial history, so-and-so. So you can pick, and then you communicate directly with the student, you work out a fee, and now with Venmo and things like that, it's just a piece of cake to, to pay them. Somebody does genealogy, and I know, Brenda, when you say you do genealogy, you know all about Ancestry.com as one of the great, uh, great resources. What's parallel to that is that what you can pull off of genealogy, the specifics you can get from Ancestry.com can allow you to search other things. So for instance, um, I found some of the people that served in the battalion with Tony Hillerman. I was able to go to a library, an archive in Mississippi. When I say go, by the way, I did this on the internet, who maintains an archive of all of the things related to that platoon and in that archive, I was able to find descriptions of the battles, things when Tony Hilleman was wounded, who picked him up off the field. And so, excuse me, I have a little bit of allergy. Uh, so sometimes what you find on archives, I mean, on ancestry.com can lead you to do more precise work through, um, oh yes, Chris is pointing out you get a cheaper price for newspaper.com. Uh, and it's not limited to genealogical facts. It's there you can you get a cheaper price. Um, I had the opposite. I only need to use Ancestry.com at the beginning of any book when I want to trace the person's roots. So I don't want to subscribe to Ancestry.com for many months, whereas Newspaper.com, I even keep going now because I still write freelance pieces and need it, but I don't keep Ancestry.com going. But Ancestry.com is an example, again, of be careful to think you've done your research. Because you go back and suddenly a uh, six cousin twice removed to your subject is loading up birth certificates, church records, things like that. And speaking of church records, um, the Catholics and the Mormons, I think, and Jews are obsessive about records. And so when I went to Sacred Heart, which is the town Hillerman was born in, 
I could find the actual leather bound books that marked when he was baptized and who presided and when he was confirmed and the name of the, the priest. And, and, you know, the key for me, because I focus on, on what people call narrative nonfiction, is the danger is when we find these facts, we report them to our readers. Instead, you can use them um, to animate your reading. So um, if, you don't, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna open this up. Um, okay, uh, do you mind if I read you a couple paragraphs from something to illustrate? Okay, this is in the first chapter of my book about Hillerman. And as they did every week, the few dozen members of Sacred Heart's Hilltop Church gathered for Mass on June 7, 1925. Breezes usually caressed the crest of the 1,060-foot-high church hill, making the spot one of the few places in central Oklahoma where relief from the summer heat could be found. I've already found out about the breezes from one diary. The, Oklahoma is pretty flat. This hill is the one place where you've got some wind. I knew the date because that's the date he was baptized. On this particular Sunday morning, August, Gus and Lucy and Hillerman came to present their 11-year-old son to the parish. Standing by the baptismal font, Father William Hospital, a Basque monk, held the child in his arms with family members by the side. The parishioners watched from the wooden pews in the luminescent church with white tin-clad walls and ceilings on which most days danced specks of colored light from the stained glass window. Father Hospital anointed the baby with oil asked those who had gathered to instruct the infant in the practices of the Catholic faith and poured holy water over his head. Afterwards, Father Opisa recorded in a leather-bound book that Anthony Grove Hillman, born May 27, 1925, had received his baptism. His first name was a family namesake. August's brother, Henry Anthony Hillman, had died 13 years earlier at age 40. The baby's middle name was the surname of his family's mother's family. Every one of those tidbits came from the kind of research I'm showing. And instead of reporting that his book is in this, his name is in the book, do you see what I did is I had the priest actually record his name. That gives the sentence a little more action. So those little nuggets of, of uh, tidbits I've gotten, uh, I think animate, the, bring the person back to that moment more so than simply reporting your facts. Oh, somebody just raised my favorite topic, obituaries. How can the best way to search your obituaries? Well, the starting point, believe it or not, is to turn to the Google. Not that you're gonna find everything there, but it's a great way to start. And simply put in your subject's name in quotation marks and put obit, you don't even spell obituary, and you'll find uh, a good starting point. Ancestry.com linked with newspapers.com has a tremendous number of obituaries. And not only that, um, depending on your figure, if they're significant, major newspapers will carry these obituaries. So going back to ProQuest or Redex, you'll find them. But it isn't just searching obituaries. Obituaries give you something that people overlook all the time which I jokingly refer to as the begatting section of the obituary, because at the end of the obituary, it tells you so-and-so is survived by and tells you who survived them. When you find, um, yes, somebody just mentioned find a grave gives you obits and memorials. It certainly does. and also gives you photographs of the tombstone, which is really cool, and the epitaphs. But when you find the begatting section, you can have a whole new cadre of people to begin searching for because the son of this person may have written a diary that might end up in archivesgrid.com, uh, archives um, or the, um, the grandson who hasn't even been born yet, because then you look up the obituary of that person, you find he survived by so-and-so, might still be alive and could be interviewed. Um, I found a manuscript uh, that was really valuable to Joseph Pulitzer because I was able to trace one of Pulitzer's ancestors to an art historian in Arlington who told me that his aunt, who is still alive in Paris, might well have this manuscript. And I contacted her and she did, and I flew to Paris. It's a real Indiana Jones kind of story. But that was all by using the obituaries as a guide not to the person's life, 
put to leads on people who might have known the person that was still alive or might have been genealogically co connected to the person. I mean, you know, um, uh, my, my father uh, wasn't a well-known person, but he kept, um, he made home movies in the 1930s, which my sister is married to a filmmaker is having them reproduced on, on DVD for the family to own. So somebody, let's say, who was doing a diplomatic history, my father's a diplomat, and wanted to know, my dad died 37 years ago, so they might think that's a dead end. But if they went to the obituary and found out I was, I was still alive and contact me, I'd say, well, I have this film footage. And that person might have film footage of how the person walked, what they looked like, what kinds of suits they are. Um, and, um, and so you, you finding these little things, you, Think about it, you probably have in your closet some photo album or a scrapbook from one of your grandparents. Somebody out there might really want that. By the way, I know I'm really sounding like I'm on, on drugs babbling on, but scrapbooks have been donated to historical societies all around the country and they're valued. And so um, sometimes it's an indirect thing. Don't think of diaries as being solely written by the subjects you want. When I was working on Pulitzer, I went to the St. Louis, the Missouri Historical Society, and the archivist there, again, archivists are your best friends, tell them what you're working on, said there's a woman who kept a diary of her life in St. Louis. And I said, did she know Pulitzer? And he said, no, I don't think she had any contact with it. But reading the diary, she made comments, terribly anti-Semitic comments about Pulitzer, which gave me a sense of what the upper class thought of him. So don't always think linearly, think about how these things could be doing. Somebody mentioned um, their brother does Ancestry.com and has not figured out how to research the female side. That is a nightmare because of our marriage laws and the way names are changed. Um, and again, you just have to, I mean, I'll give you, I'm back to Pulitzer. Kate Pulitzer is a heroine in my mind, of, but you know what they did with her papers? They threw them out because she's a woman. And that happened a lot. Uh, so researching the female side can be challenging. Of course, the starting place with Ancestry.com is to find their birth names because they're often linked after their marriage names uh, or find their marriage certificates, which many of you know are usually easy to find. Death certificates are harder to obtain um, depending on when the person died. But death certificates can be really helpful um, I grew up in a world where I had relatives who had cancer, but my parents never used the word, nor did their friends or relatives. They just sort of talked about, a, you know, they're sick, they're ill. It was a stigma to having cancer. Uh, the death certificate can give you, do, give you direct answers to that. Um, it, can, um, it can tell you, um, I don't want to be lugubrious, but Tony Hillerman's end was pretty awful. He couldn't breathe. And the death certificate and his doctor were able to really help me flesh out what that was like. And so death certificates are valuable documents and they're, they're easily found, as well as marriage certificates are found too. Um, census records, oh gosh, I forgot to mention census records. Census records are so terrific because they don't just tell you uh, something about your person, they also tell you who else lived in that building uh, or lived next door or things like that. And you can find the color composition of the, um, of the neighborhood, whether they were living in an integrated neighborhood, the average age, you can find out the average education, where they worked, how many cars they had in the driveway. I mean, talk about being able to flesh out material. And census records are released 71 or 72 years after they are out. So I think we're getting up to 1940. And depending on the year, the amount of information they collected is enormous. Um, it tells you the amount of education, where they were born. Um, and Brenda points out many, oh, it, 1940s is already up, thank you. Um, I tend to research older stuff. So 1940s is up. Um, and uh, again, Ancestry.com has tremendous digital access to that. But if you ever do travel, going to the National Archives and using their collection is really exciting and gives you a lot of stuff. Somebody mentioned cemeteries also have records. Yes, they do, and they have, and some of the stuff is you need to go to the cemetery, and if they'll let you, they'll pull the cards, 
And it gives you great information because it can help you track descendants who might still be alive and sending in a little money to maintain the cemetery. Um, you can find out about uh, very often, for instance, um, uh, you know, uh, children, more, infant mortality was very high. And so, um, so sometimes these deaths are not necessarily recorded in a way you might know. So the person you think is the firstborn could have been the thirdborn. And sometimes going to the cemetery, you'll find that kind of information. I had the thrill of going to a cemetery in Mako, Hungary. And after World War II, uh, Jews fled from Hungary because of the treatment in large um, numbers. And the Jewish cemetery there was maintained by a caretaker who took me out to the cemetery. And I said, who pays for your work? I mean, you're out there all the time. Um, and he said, I get checks and uh, $10 checks, et cetera. And they come from places like your Brooklyn, New York, Bronx, New York, and things like that. And these are families who send every year a check to maintain their family's graves. Well, going to see the graves was really helpful because it turned out in the 19th century, a lot of the Jews in Eastern Europe did not maintain last names. And when the Austrian Hungarian Empire demanded that they have last names, they often said, took on the name like Pulitzer, which means from the town of Pulitz. So I was able to trace all kinds of other Pulitzers and learn about them. And then it was this, one of the first times in my life I was exposed to the Jewish tradition of putting pebbles on the gravestone. Now, did that really matter to my research? Maybe, maybe not, but it emotionally changed me, which changed the tenor of my writing. Uh, Eve mentioned sense and records, only one way to find my father's birth, the courthouse burnt down, oh, that is a nightmare. Only the Bible, may, Bible might have been used, but the administration wouldn't accept the Bible record. Well, that's true. Um, St. Louis has a famous fire that destroyed lots of American uh, uh, government records, and you run into that, and that's nice. There's a book, of, I wanted to write a book about Edward Bellamy, and his first biographer had all his papers in his house in Western Massachusetts, and the house burnt down. So I'm never gonna be able to talk a publisher into letting me write a book in which there are no records left, so common fate in our lives. Um, what people are reading is great. Uh, oh, wait, let me stop. Yes, I've had luck tracing people in foreign countries. Um, one starting place is if they came to the United States, you of course want to start with the Ellis Island and Castle Rock records. Um, because the Ellis Island records are digitally searchable and you can find the ship that they arrived on from the ship manifest. Galveston was another arrival area and I don't know what kinds of digitization of records they have, but when you find those ship manifests, they often told you specifically what county they came from. Now, if you're looking for Irish records, you are in luck because the Irish have discovered that Americans are not so about researching their past. And every little town in Ireland has a full-time archivist who's ready to help you, often for a fee, or ready to welcome you. But those ship records working backwards are often the clue because they'll tell you what county they left from and when they left from. With that information, you can find other records which will tell you about landowning records, marriage licenses, death certificates in that county. Uh, Germany has some similar stuff. I noticed Eve, you're talking about Germany. Um, German immigration, there's some German immigration websites, as well as the um, Ellis Island and Boston Harbor. Germans, a lot of them came through the Boston Harbor. Um, in my case, oh, 1937, oh, you may be in luck because 20th century stuff is, uh, is much more common. And he was a Jew, which means that there's some really good records to start with. Um, I, and I'll get to military records in a second. I know this is um, even it's going to sound weird for me to suggest this, but I would open up a conversation with the Holocaust Museum. Their, their intent is to record the Holocaust, but they in a minute or two will tell you about what kinds of records about immigration, because they know the world. It's shop talk. It's like if you call, I get letters all the time about prison research or Navajo research or something like that. Um, it's not my field, but because I've been tangentially related to it, I get stuff. I would start there, but I would say if your stepfather left in 37 and you have his full name, you're likely to find a ship's manifest 
uh, and some uh, religious records that are possible. Military records are really interesting. The National Archives has, has them. Um, depending on the war, uh, I'll let his daughter know because now they can speak German. Um, Eve, why don't you um, do this? Send me a note with some of the details about this. And I might have some, a couple ideas and I'll reply to you in the next day record. Yeah, the LDS records to help. Um, the LDS and Ancestry, even though Ancestry.com was a Mormon company, uh, they, they have no, com no restrictions. They, they research everybody's past. Um, military records are, are tricky depending on when the war was. And some are open and some are not. I was able to get um, tremendously useful Civil War records um, uh, about Joseph Pulitzer. Um, but what I got that was particularly useful was about another character that I was working on because he wanted a Civil War pension. And in order to get the pension, he had to submit affidavits. And the affidavits were filled with handwritten descriptions of his life, his farm. I mean, they were just a treasure trove of stuff. But I wouldn't have known that because I assumed the affidavits were just substantiating his claim on, on being in the Civil War. Um, in Hillerman's case, I was able to find uh, his jacket of service, which told me what days he was out sick. It gave me a description of his wounding. And also from them, I was able to get at the National Archives just outside of Washington, the, uh, I, I've, I'm not a military person, I forget what they're called, but they like the daily reports, which tells you who was, who has showed up for, for combat that day and where they were and what the condition, you know. One of the most fascinating experiences for me, whether I was to write fiction or nonfiction, is that particularly of World War II, you had the poor men and men, I say, these are teenagers up front shooting at the Germans and a tent behind them is somebody at a typewriter typing up all this stuff for people in Washington and all this stuff exists. So the records are, are just phenomenal. Um, I can tell you when the first time Hellman got to have a shower and how much she sank. Um, you know, these kinds of, it's all there in the National Archives. And the National Archives not only have tremendously helpful archivists, but they have terrific finding aids. Mistake I should have pointed out. All archives maintain what are called finding aids or finding guides. And these are guides that you can search before you go to the library, which will tell you whose correspondence they have. So if you know that your person um, wrote like uh, uh, John Nichols, who I've corresponded with, his papers are, oh, I, I actually, it's a funny one. I corresponded with Tony Hillman in 1978 or something. And so if you were researching my life and you looked at the Tony Hillman finders guide, you'd find letters written to him in 1978. You open up the file folder, there's a letter by me. So these finding aids will help narrow your, your work in finding these things. If it's a particularly influential person, they may have letters from your person who may not be as important. Um, and the other thing about it is uh, a word to the wise. Famous people know they're gonna be remembered. So they tend to clean up their act before they die. They tend to destroy girlfriend letters. They tend to destroy unflattering stuff, that kind of stuff. So when you find a letter as I did, and I'm gonna make up the name and description, but it's based on truth. A letter to Joseph Pulitzer from somebody saying, Mr. Pulitzer, I met with you yesterday. You are certainly one of the most impressive and wonderful figures I've ever come across in my 52 years of selling paper to newspapers around the country. So you know this guy's a newspaper, a paper salesman who needs the million pounds of paper contract from Hilleman. So I looked him up and I found he had papers somewhere else. And in those papers were letters he wrote to his wife. And when she said, I met with Joseph Pulitzer today, what an SOB he was, but I had to be nice to him because I want to sell him paper. So, you know, it's this, if you like detective shows as much as I do, it's, it's that business of thinking outside the box. You get a name you have a lead and a lead is no different than that, that cops pursuing it. it. Just happens your subjects are all dead and may not be able to answer your name, but they've left records behind and you can need to find them. So, um, and sometimes people keep stuff. Um, I, I have two letters here from John Nichols that I'm gonna to donate to the archives, but right now I'm the one who has it. So 
you know, anybody said contact. I mean, I wrote to everybody I knew at contact with Hillerman and they found pictures and letters and scrap things that weren't in the archives. So um, I've, I think I've exhausted you. I've been at this for an hour. Yeah.